In this video lecture, we're going to discuss some of the high points about what rhetoric is. These are ideas you're going to need to succeed in TCOM 3130 when we talk about technical communication and rhetoric. So we're just briefly going over the ideas of rhetoric, remind you what it is, how it works, and so on. There we go. To begin, let's talk about what rhetoric is. The most common definition that you're used to hearing is some sort of politician blathering on. That both is and isn't rhetoric. So we're going to ignore that for the moment, and we're going to go with Aristotle. The definition that most people know, it comes from Aristotle, and it says that rhetoric is the ability to see the available means of persuasion. There are all sorts of different definitions of what rhetoric is, but this is the one that we're going to run with because it is very simple and it works very well. Using rhetoric, then, you're going to use it to gain cooperation, you're going to use it to express yourself and propose ideas. Isn't that a bit dangerous, though, the idea of trying to use the persuasion to get your way? Definitely. It can be very, very dangerous. Uh, the thing is that valid arguments are not going to be sophistic. And when we say sophistic, that is a... Uh, we need to go off on a little tangent and talk about what that means. Back in the day, the sophists were uh, rhetors for hire. There were teachers for hire that would go around and they would teach people whatever they wanted to know. So... Uh, you want to know how to speak well? Here you go. I'm going to teach you all the tricks of speaking. You want to learn how to work with the law? I'm going to teach you all about how to win law lawsuits and cases. So, so sophists got kind of a bad rap. They had a lot of good stuff going for them, but at the same time, they were sort of hired guns. So when we say sophistic rhetoric, it usually has a bad, uh, bad connotation to it. So what we're going to be talking about here, though, is not just sophistic arguments as in, I'm going to manipulate people to get my way. It's, I'm going to present ideas and try to persuade them that what I'm saying is actually a good thing because it is a good thing. Accordingly, good arguments are going to use two things, rhetoric and dialectic. We've talked about what rhetoric is a little bit. We're going to talk about more about how it works. But I'm going to briefly explain dialectic. Dialectic is the approach of arguments just based on reason and logic. We'll come back to that idea a little bit later, but I want to focus on the idea that dialectic is just purely logical. It is not anything else. It is just facts, 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 point, counterpoint. Is there some area in the middle where we should meet that makes sense? There are three types of rhetorical discourse in classical rhetoric. Forensic or judicial, deliberative or legislative, and epideictic or ceremonial. At forensic judicial rhetoric is about the past. It asks, what happened? Deliberative or legislative rhetoric is about the future. We are here. Where do we go from here? What is coming next? Epideictic or ceremonial rhetoric is about what's going on right now. It's usually oriented toward praising or blaming for someone for what is going on. There are things called the canons of rhetoric as well. These are classical ideas. We have invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. So if we have somebody who is going to give a speech, as especially this was the case in classical Greek, uh, Greece, where this all came from, this person would go through these stages. The person would first think about what it is that I want to talk about. What evidence do I have to support my points or to support my claim? Then arrangement. The speaker, the rhetor, would put their ideas in order. They would choose words to make those ideas sound good. They would memorize their speech, and they would stand up and deliver that speech. So in these modern times, we don't use memory quite so much because we're, we use writing, and we don't need to memorize things. But at the same time, it is a valid thing. So even though we don't uh, use it so much, remember invention, arrangement, style, memory, and delivery. We have a thing called Canavi's Rhetorical Triangle. Canavi was a rhetorical thinker, and he came up with this to explain how do uh, different texts, what sort of uh, emphasis do they have, and why do they work they do. So we've got the text in the middle, and a text can be words uh, that are spoken, can be words that are written, a text can actually be pictures, it can be anything that carries meaning and argument of any kind. So we've got the signal in the middle. 
On the upper left-hand corner, we have the encoder, the rhetor, that is the writer or speaker, the person who is using rhetoric. Then, on the upper right-hand corner, we have the decoder. That's our audience, the person who is reading, listening, viewing, whatever it may be. Then at the very bottom corner, we've got reality. That is the thing that the text is referring to. Now, hopefully, we all are discussing the same reality, and that is a that's a philosophical question, and it's a fairly deep one, but we aren't really going to get into this. We're going to assume, for the sake of argument, that everyone is grounded in the same reality. So then, Let's move that signal up toward the encoder. In this case, the signal is kind of ignoring the audience, it is ignoring reality, and it is just saying, this is what I have inside of me, it needs to get out. It's all, your text is expressive. We move the text over to the decoder, then it's just persuasive. It does not have anything to do with what I really think. It doesn't have anything to do with what reality really is. It's just me trying to persuade someone. This can be dangerous. It can be really manip manipulative. Then if we move the signal all the way down to reality, it's just straight up information. Data, data, data. It is very likely in the realm of dialectic here. At the same time, you can see it's probably not particularly persuasive, because if it's not about what I have inside of me and I'm expressing myself, it's not about the audience, it's just about data, well, data is not very interesting. So this is, helps us figure out where these ideas land. You can move that signal anywhere you like to around inside that and achieve some sort of a balance. What are the available means of persuasion that we talk about in terms of rhetoric? Well, they depend your audience, your purpose, your context. What you want to do is, quote-unquote, read the rhetorical situation. Where is this rhetorical act going on? What is your audience like? What kind of message are you delivering? Is it good or bad? How is it going to be received? Also, the medium of the message. Uh, there's a famous communication scholar from 1960s, Marshall McLuhan. He has a, uh, a saying, the medium is the message. So, the vehicle for communicating that for carrying your message can have as much effect as the thing you are trying to communicate itself. So when you create uh, rhetorical arguments or analyze rhetorical arguments, appeals should be based on these readings of the rhetorical situation. There are four basic rhetorical appeals you've undoubtedly talked about before, but we're going to review them anyway. They're ethos, pathos, logos, and kairos. We're going to use everyone's favorite plutocrat from The Simpsons, Charles Montgomery Burns, to discuss these. Let's talk ethos. Ethos is an appeal to character. Is someone trustworthy? Is someone credible? What kind of person, generally speaking, is the, pe is the speaker, or what kind of person does that speaker appear to be? So in the case of Charles Montgomery Burns, hmm, he appears to be evil. He is probably not trustworthy. I can believe what he says if he's threatening me, and yeah, he just seems to be kind of a bad guy. So he has a very negative ethos. Pathos. Pathos is an appeal to emotion. It has the same root as the word pathetic. Pathos is an appeal to sympathy, to the reader's or, or listener's imagination. Vivid language is an example of pathos. It generally, pathos is how the rhetor feels about the subject. Now, it can be the case that I'm manipulating somebody and trying to get something from them by appealing to their emotions. Well, I don't believe it myself, but oftentimes it is how the rhetor is expressing her or himself. So we're going to see how Monty Burns here, what he thinks about his clothes in terms of pathos. Are you sure you want to go through with this, sir? You do have a very full wardrobe as it is. Yes but not completely full. You see, some men hunt for sport, others hunt for food. The only thing I'm hunting for is an outfit that looks good. See my vest. 
see my best made from real goulash. Is it in this sweater? There's no better than authentic Irish setter. See this hat? It was my cat. My evening wear, vampire bat. These white slippers are albino, African endangered rhino. Grizzly bear underwear, turtle's necks. I've got my share. Beret of poodle on my noodle, it shall rest. Try my red robin suit. It comes one breast door two. See my vest, see my vest, see my vest. Like my loafers, former goofers. It was that who skinned my shoulders, but a gray hamper tuxedo would be best. So let's prepare these dogs. Kill two for matching dogs. See my vest, see my vest. Oh, please, won't you see my I really like the vest. I got her too. <gasps> He's gonna make a tuxedo out of our puppies. Na 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 na. Hi. Sorry, you gotta admit it's catchy. So then we have logos. Logos is based on logic. You have to have a clear claim to have good logos. You have to have a consistent claim and consistent evidence to be based on a good logos argument. And your uh, supporting evidence also has to be very effective. So, if Monty Burns says that he is the 1% and that he's going to release the hounds on you, is this an appeal to logic? Hmm, yes, he is rich, he can afford to do this, and it doesn't matter what he does because he is so rich. Is the claim clear? Yes. Is it consistent with what, his, uh, uh, what he can actually do? Well, yes, he will release the hounds. Is the effectiveness of supporting evidence, are the hounds going to be bounding after you, snapping at your heels? Yes. Okay, great. Good logos. Then we have Kairos. Kairos is something people tend to forget about, but it's very, very valuable as well. Kairos is an appeal to timeliness. You have to have an argument at the right moment, and you have to have a good effect of time, place, and culture for an argument to make sense and be appealing. For example, if Monty says that he wants to send a letter to the Prussian consulate in Siam by Aramail, and is he too late for the 430 autogyro? He's got lousy, lousy Kairos. Prussia hasn't existed since World War I. Prussia is now part of Poland. Siam is an old name for Thailand. Aeromail, well, all the mail goes by airplane now, but back in the day you actually had to sp spend extra money and uh, get a special stamp and probably use lightweight paper if you wanted to have something sent by airmail. And autogyro. Autogyros are things that don't really exist much anymore. It's a, uh, it's essentially a stunt plane that has a free-spinning propeller on top, so it can take off in very short distances and do all sorts of acrobatics. So he's got lousy, lousy Kairos here. There are other channels of appeal. I can't possibly go over them all, but I'm going to go over some of the bigger ones that are very useful in terms of uh, figuring out how to persuade people. First one let's talk about is primacy and latency. Primacy and latency are is an effect of where things are put in an argument. If it's first, you have primacy. If it's last, you have latency. Generally speaking, people will remember things that are first and that are last. So, if Mayor Quimby submitted reimbursement requests for his government-related expenses, including lunch at the Legitimate Businessmen's Social Club, parking at the Springfield Squidport, two pairs of oversized scissors for ribbon-cutting duties, a ruby pinky ring, three golden shovels for construction starting ceremonies, five new mayor sashes, and two full-time bodyguards. Are these legitimate expenses? Well, notice there's one stuck right in the middle that where it's going to be overlooked. That one is definitely not a uh, real, uh, genuine expense. All the others, yeah, you could con conceivably get uh, good reasons for having a mayor submit expenses for those. Another channel of appeal is the verb choice. For example, I'm going to show you a little clip from The Simpsons, and here's the setup. Nelson, the bad kid, he forced Bart to shoot a BB gun at a bird that was sitting on its nest. Bart was not really wanting to do this. He aimed, pulled off the side, pulled the trigger, and BAM! Nailed the bird. Bart then felt really, really bad, so he climbed up in the tree, and he talked to the two eggs that he found sitting there in the nest. Oh my god! Hi, little eggs. 
I'm not sure how to tell you this, but your, your mom was involved in an incident. Mistakes were made by me. But don't worry, I'll take care of you. Gotta go back here. Gotta stop. Oh my. Stop. So, what happened here? Notice the words that Bart used. Mistakes were made by me. He was trying to get out of it and weasel out by using the passive voice. Mistakes were made. Who made the mistakes? The language doesn't say. So sometimes people, when they're trying to escape responsibility, will use the uh, passive voice instead of an active voice. So there are different ways to phrase things, to say someone is doing or something, something happened to somebody. You can identify, you can hide, but generally speaking, the verbs you use are really, really important. Always think about your verbs. Ah, come on. Then, high, middle, and low style. High style is fancy language. Middle style is, uh, call it, ordinary written discourse. And then low style is uh, language of the streets, everyday, common speech. For example, Lisa Simpson revealed that her failure to age normally stemmed from somatotropin antagonists that Homer covertly administered via her morning repast. You're probably wondering what? How about this? Homer Simpson laced Lisa's breakfast cereal with anti-growth hormones that kept her from aging normally. Ah, that makes a lot more sense. So we have high style, and we have middle style, and then we also have an example of low style. Homer doped up Lisa so she wouldn't age. So. You need to pick the language that is appropriate for the situation, for your audience, and so on. Another channel of appeal is figures of speech. There are many, many, there are literally uh, hundreds of figures of speech. Uh, but we're going to use some of the more exam the uh, common ones here in this example. Milhouse Mussolini Van Houten, the sad sack of Springfield, failed to climb the ladder of success, so Lisa dumped him like a bad habit. What figures of speech do we see going on here? Well, for one, we've got alliteration. Milhouse Mussolini, sad sack of Springfield. Okay, how about metaphors? There are two of these going on here. A metaphor says one thing equals another. In this case, Milhouse equals sad sack. What else is a metaphor here? The ladder of success. Is there such a thing literally as a ladder of success? No, there isn't. So this is a metaphor. We've also got a simile. A simile is going to say one thing is similar to, is like or as another thing. So in this case, Lisa dumped Milhouse like a bad habit. There's a simile. Any figure of speech, that is a piece of rhetoric. It has some sort of effect on the audience. And we don't use these just because they exist. We're always trying to find some sort of way to persuade our audience. The length of the sentences that you use and the structures of the grammar that you use can also have a big effect. So, as an example, forgive me while I read this to you, long sentences that use compound or complex sentence structures increase the text's difficulty, yet they also tend to engage a reader's attention and can express sophisticated relationships that short sentences cannot. But, what if we rephrase it, saying that short sentences are easier to read, but they can be too simple. So, if you look at the first one, it's a complex sentence, but you look at it, I mean, it's compound, complex, and it's getting a big, complex idea across. The second one says it very bluntly, but perhaps a little too bluntly. So, this length of a sentence and the various structures that you use to put these sentences together are of themselves rhetorical appeals. Speaking of sentence structures, we've got four of them in English. Simple sentences, compound sentences, complex sentences, and compound complex sentences. I'm not going to go into these. This is something you would have covered years ago in English classes. I'm just going to say you want to make sure that you pick the right structure based on your audience and your subject. So to review everything we've talked about so far, we've defined rhetoric, we've talked about the relationship of rhetoric and dialectic, we've talked about three types of rhetorical discourse, the canons of rhetoric, Canavy's rhetorical triangle, four basic rhetorical appeals, 
and several of the multiple channels of appeal that can be used in terms of rhetoric. So keeping these ideas in mind, this is a primer that will help you uh, when we move on and start talking about how to use uh, rhetoric in technical communication, how it works, and what it's good for.